Hello, I'm Volker Runke. For the fourth volume in my Levy and Campaign series for GMT Games, designer Francisco Paco Gradaige brings our historical board games set in the Middle Ages forward to the mid-15th century and into the famous Wars of the Roses. It is a story full of ambitious characters, dysfunctional families, and turns of fate that inspired, among others, the great William Shakespeare. We call the game Plantagenet, Cousins' War for England, and I would like to tell you a little about how Paco's design leads our series in new directions to depict politically, as well as operationally, the dynastic conflict that in those long ago years roiled the Kingdom of England. I won't attempt here to lay out the complicated dynastic intricacies behind the Wars of the Roses. We can find plenty of material out there on that. In capsule summary, as best I understand it myself, England's royal house of Plantagenet, late in the Hundred Years' War, divided into two main branches from descendants of different children of the strong 14th century warrior king, Edward III, one from Edward's son John, who was Duke of Lancaster, and another that joined lines from Edward's sons Lionel and Edmund, the latter a Duke of York. You can trace a succession of each competing branch or house, York and Lancaster, in the family trees that Paco provides in the game's background booklet. In the 15th century, the long war against the King of France ended badly for England. And, what was worse, England's Lancastrian ruler at the time, King Henry VI, was not at all the effective sovereign needed to weather the final defeats. In the 1450s, push came to shove in Henry's court between royal claimant Richard, Duke of York, and the Lancastrian supporters of Henry, led by Duke of Somerset. White and red roses came to symbolize these two factions, who would now come to blows over their competing claims to the throne. Key to understanding the operational nature of the warfare that ensued and that Paco has modeled for us in Plantagenet is that lords fought the Wars of the Roses neither on behalf of different religions or ethnicities, nor to carve out and conquer a chunk of foreign territory, nor to assert regional dominance of any broadly based constituency. Instead, this was warfare over the disputes among those at the very top. Of course, the wars drew lower nobles and common people into military preparations and campaigns, but the cause remained the comparatively narrow dynastic ambitions of a rarefied elite, many of whom were of the same extended family. So, there was an inside baseball nature to the fight. Campaigns saw very little of the usual medieval ravaging of the countryside or sieges and sacks of population centers. The dynasts on either side were fighting for personal legitimacy on the throne and were correspondingly eager to gain influence and favor with nobles and people alike to demonstrate the propriety of their royal claims and the quality of their kingship. To be sure, the enemy's army in the field had to be met. But wrecking the kingdom in the process would not do. Campaigns often sought to track down and deal with the other side's claimants and family members personally, often to execute them. It was truly and literally a grand and extended argument among cousins. In this volume of Levian Campaign, then, we have the familiar Lord Cylinders moving across a map of England, each Lord with a mat showing their troop pieces, vassal and asset markers, and capability cards. Levy will see the lords on each side build up their strength. Here we use exchangeable lord playing cards on blank mats because the cast of characters across several Wars of the Roses that you can play out is rather larger in number than in the earlier games that use dedicated mats for each lord. A calendar tracks when more lords might be ready to muster for the fight and how long vassals can be expected to serve. Campaigns will involve lords' supply, march, and battle featuring the array of lords and their various types of troops and specialist capabilities against each other. 
but to invite us into these particular dynastic clashes of 1459 to 1485, Plantagenet departs more than ever before from the series' usual levy and campaign mechanics. In this video, I will try to show you how this levy and campaign volume four will, for the first time in the series, challenge players to manage dynastic conflict, including political favor, parley and influence, the depletion, exhaustion, and pillage of locales, exile, battle, and death of lords, and finally, the succession of royal heirs across the many years of this prolonged Cousins' War for England. Paco and our historical consultant Graham Evans found that the campaigns that made up the Wars of the Roses saw very few cases of military conquest of cities, towns, or castles. So we have in Plantagenet no siege or bypass of strongholds, no garrisons, no storming the walls, no sally or relief sally. All of those more complicated mechanics of the earlier Levian campaign games regarding walled strongholds and how to take them, fall out of the game here. Instead of conquering strongholds for victory points, your Plantagenet lords will be seeking the favor of locales across England. Red or white rose favor markers will show which locales align with one or the other side's claims to the throne, or with neither and it will not be combat that attains such favor for your side. Lords on campaign will instead parley to attempt to convince a town or city to recognize its claims to the English throne. To parley, lords will wager their side's general influence over English nobles and subjects tracked along the board's edge. That influence will be the main currency in the game. Yes, Provender and coin will still be key to maintaining armies in the field, perhaps more so, as we, as we shall see in a moment. But political influence will serve as the main resource fueling the quest for dominance, and aside standing and influence will determine who wins the wars in the end. The receptiveness of local notables to a lord's attempts to persuade them can be uncertain, so parlay often will mean betting your side's influence points to roll influence checks for success. Handy tables on the game's player aid foldout summarize how to gain and spend influence points and how to carry out these influence checks. And just as lordship shows lords various abilities directly to gather resources for war, a new influence rating shows their clout in wooing allies to their side's cause. You might be just the run-of-the-mill earl with an influence of two, or you might be the queen with an influence of four, or you might be the royal pretender himself, or the kingmaker with five. The higher this influence rating, the easier and cheaper it will be for your lord to pass an influence check. And such influence is not just for your lords to parlay their way into favor with this or that town on the map. They will also use it to persuade lords on their side to muster, as well as to persuade otherwise neutral or at best leaning vassals to join the cause, vassals from a panoply of prominent families inhabiting their seats across the English countryside. In addition to generally neutral or leaning vassals, special vassals like Hastings or Montague will join only one side via capability cards and bring with them special historical talents and capacities. Vassals in Plantagenet are powerful in battle, and neutral vassals add their estates as taxable seats for their higher lords to obtain precious coin when they join that side. But these vassals always have a service limit after which your side is expending its influence each turn to keep them in the field. The more neutral vassals you muster, the stronger you are, but eventually your dependence on these local families to fund your war will undermine your side's standing in the kingdom.
Just as the Wars of the Roses saw little siege and sack of towns, there likewise was little of the usual medieval military practice of ravaging the enemy's countryside to punish and pressure enemy lords to give in. After all, here you are trying to convince everyone to support your claimant to the throne, not to terrorize them. And anyway, it's your kingdom you are defending, or hope to rule soon, so you sure don't want to destroy it to win it. So, no ravage actions in Plantagenet and no loot. However, that hardly means that war's appetite for goods will not take its toll on the land. Even once local authorities favor your cause, there remain limits to how much help they are willing, or perhaps even able, to give your lords in their family fight amongst themselves. In Plantagenet, when your lords levy troops, draw supply or forage for provender, or tax for coin, they will not only need a suitable locale that favors their cause, they will deplete and then exhaust that locale to do so. And, this late in the Middle Ages, money is an even bigger deal than it was before in our earlier volumes. Rather than pay as an option to extend your lord's feudally obligated service, in Plantagenet, you will have to pay your lord's troops coin each turn, or they will pillage their surroundings to take the compensation that they feel they deserve. Pillage by unpaid troops will exhaust their current locale, shift favor there, and roundabouts toward the enemy's cause and cost your side overall influence. And if the troops don't get enough from that, your lord's army will disband and cost you even more influence. As you might already have guessed, unfed troops will do the same. Not just shorten service by some number of days of campaigns, but pillage to get the food that the troops need. The consequences to your campaign can be severe, so please folks, don't let your Plantagenet lords run out of coin to pay their hard-working troops or the provender to feed them. Of course, the immediate reason for all this muster, care, and feeding of those hungry and expensive troops is to hunt down and smite the enemy lords who might deny you your rightful crown. Paco determined that, in the context of dynastic conflict in the Wars of the Roses, there was not really the option when contesting for the kingdom's favor and influence to just lead the enemy army on some merry chase across the countryside. Among the Battle of Verse Lords of earlier games, you almost always had the choice to simply back away from an approaching enemy army. But here in Plantagenet, meeting and killing or capturing your competing claimants and their supporters before your supplies and coin run out is the main point for both sides. No avoiding battle to an adjacent locale here. However, as defeat in battle almost certainly would mean capture or death of your heirs and high lords, more on that in a moment, in a dire case, the somewhat ignominious option for flight into exile is there. At the cost of influence standing, your lords, upon enemy approach, can disband into exile outside of England and beyond the enemy's reach. In the game, exile lords will spend a little time on the calendar, making their way to France or Burgundy or Scotland or Ireland to remuster there into an exile box having set themselves up with new retinues with the help of foreign powers. On the map, but outside England, lords in such exile can continue to build their army within some limits. Eventually, however, they must sail by ship to land on English shores, or perhaps march, if out of Scotland, if they are to renew their campaign for the crown. Shakespeare's rhythmic line about a horse and a kingdom, which in the play Richard III repeats at the Battle of Bosworth, might lead us to expect armored horse units aplenty in Plantagenet. Richard, after all, historically did lead a final charge by horse in that climactic Wars of the Roses battle. But in fact, 
Most battles in the Wars of the Roses, just like those late in the Hundred Years' War, were fought on foot. Aside from some specialized combat effects through Arts of War cards, such as one depicting that famous final charge by Richard, the game's unit types reflect this. The troops in Plantagenet are all foot. Without horse units in the mix, we get a reduced number of battle strike initiative steps in the game, since we don't have to worry about horse melee as separate from foot melee. And this is just one way that Plantagenet, in order better to represent its particular conflict within the Levian campaign system, ends up streamlining battle resolution. In most Levian campaign games, the defending side in battle has an advantage. Its troops strike first within each initiative step. This reflects the defender's historical advantage of being able to choose your terrain, rest, and take your time arraying your troops as the attackers approach. Indeed, the main historical battles within the campaigns depicted in other Levian campaign volumes, Pipus in Nevsky, Sagrajas in Almoravid, Monteperti in Inferno, and Agincourt and Manzikert in the upcoming Henry and Seljuk, respectively, did see victory go to the operational defender. But review by Paco and Graham of the historical record of engagements in the Wars of the Roses showed no such advantage to the defenders. For whatever reasons, in this conflict, the army that was marching to engage tended to win. Therefore, Plantagenet's battle sequence takes a different approach. Opposing lords are grouped, by a simple rule, into separate engagements within the larger battle array. All lords within each such engagement strike simultaneously. First all missiles, then all melee. There are some new twists to highlight the battle roles of heirs and high lords personally. Each lord, by a valor rating, starts a battle with a set number of valor counters that you expend to reroll armor saves. Each lord has an elite retinue counter, sometimes along with vassal counters, that fight as especially tough units, but if a retinue routes, that lord's entire force routes along with it. Battles in the Wars of the Roses very often ended in the death on the field or by immediate execution of the losing lords. They were traitors to the rightful king, after all. In Plantagenet, each lord routed in battle will roll for death, meaning permanent removal. However, should battle start to go badly for your lords, they can flee. This replaces the usual concede the field option in the other games. You simply flip the Lord's retinue counter over to fled, the Lord then routes, but he benefits from a reduction to the chance of dying after the battle. You may recall that the earlier Levian campaign volumes each play out no more than two or three years of conflict total. Pantagenet's various scenarios, in contrast, take on multiple spasms of dynastic conflict spanning several decades, the 1450s to the 1480s, and known collectively as the Wars of the Roses. A Wars of the Roses grand scenario in the game enables you to link and play out the three main periods of warfare within this conflict, with the outcomes of both victory or defeat and death or survival of various heirs in one conflict setting up the situation in the next. With the succession of Yorkist and Lancastrian heirs, the grand scenario adds another way to win. If you can kill off enough of the enemy's line of succession, the wars are over. That also means that the full Wars of the Roses game amplifies the risk of every campaign and each battle involving your remaining heirs. With multiple linked wars, heirs' death and succession, Plantagenet offers a wide stage for your gameplay to tell its own dynastic story. At the same time, to keep each act faithful to the war's historical character, different Arts of War cards accompany each scenario, denoted by the presence or absence of roses at the middle of the cards. 
accompanying you through this theater of war, the bard himself, to voice the titles of many of the all-new events and capabilities in the game. Special capabilities of individual lords, special troops, special vassals, and much more. I hope, after this mere glimpse into the history that comes in the box, you will join me for all the pageantry of this unique entry into Levian campaign. Plantagenet is packed with dastardly personages, political and military maneuver, and battlefield clash and calamity. For me, Paco and the Plantagenet test development and art teams have brought to life, as no other game yet has, both the dynastic and operational drama of the Wars of the Roses. If you want to see more and perhaps parley with us about Plantagenet or about any of the Levian Campaign volumes, printed or in work, please join us on the Levian Campaign Discord server. Let me know via Twitter or Mastodon, and I'll be happy to get you an invite link. Until next time, this is Volker Runke. Enjoy the games.